What's up everyone and welcome to today's video that is probably one of the most valuable and most important videos that I've made here on this channel for quite a while. And in this video, I wanna show you a full A to Z setup for how to create or how to optimize for the ideal perfect performance max campaign, especially or primarily for e-commerce brands. So if you have an e-commerce brand, if you use Google Ads and you want the perfect PMAX setup, you want to update and refresh and optimize an existing one, then this video is 100% exactly for you. Now in this video, I will go through literally everything from you know how to build your uh, performance max campaign, the right budgets and bits, asset groups, how to pick the right assets, what's important with assets, how to structure your performance max campaigns. Do you need one, PM, uh, one asset group or 10, right? All of those things. And at the same time, I will base that on an actual real life example. So instead of just talking about all the theoretical concepts, I have this store here that is um, a competitor of one of our clients actually, but I will show you using this particular store here, what I would do. I would show you which assets I would use, which audiences I would research and so on and so forth so that you have a very visual and easy to understand experience for how to apply it to your brand, regardless of course of what you sell. Now, very quickly, why is this called the $12 million PMAX setup? Well, because we have spent $12 million on PMAX across our clients. As you can see in the screenshot here, this is our PMAX only ad spend in euros, which amounts to roughly $12 million. The conversion value is a little bit inaccurate because we have some mixed currencies right there, but all in all, or in general, um, this is just about right. Probably 50 something million dollars in PMAX only revenue from our active clients. This is from real world data from, you know, clients making up to $2 million a month in revenue and uh, some really, really large performance max campaigns. This is the agenda for the video today. So first of all, let me just adjust this a little bit here. So first of all, I will talk about the ideal PMAX setup and the perfect settings. This will be relatively straightforward, but very important so that you know how to best set up the campaign itself. Then I will talk about budgets and bids. You know, what do you have to keep in mind to determine the perfect budget, the right bidding strategy, etc. Then we start with the, with the actual juicy stuff with asset group structure for maximum performance, no pun intended here. Um, the, basically many people confuse asset groups versus campaigns, when to use asset groups, when to use multiple campaigns, what should be in each asset groups, uh, in each asset group, how many do you need? One, two, three, five, ten. I will go through all these points here as well. Then I want to talk about assets that actually perform. Many people have no idea how to actually build good assets. You know, do you just use the images from your store? What is like the secret sauce behind that? Then audiences 101. So how do you pick audiences that perform? Um, what sort of settings are important here? Uh, what do you, sh what should you start with? And then how do you continue after some traffic and, and sales and everything? And then ultimately as a sort of subsection, not that long, um, I talk about asset group product selection. So most of you are probably equal e-commerce brand owners or, or working for e-commerce brands rather than lead gen. But this, of course, will be fully shopping and, and you know, e-com specific. But the entire video here is actually tailored towards e-commerce brands. Now, just one more second before we start, the focus of that video is performance and immediate results. So we don't talk about branding here. We don't talk about infinite budgets where you can just test everything randomly and, and just go through it like that. And also a little disclaimer that this is the perfect setup. Um, you can apply it whenever you like to with an existing campaign or with a new campaign, but of course it requires ongoing maintenance, optimization and improvement, right? So when we work with clients, especially with large budgets, we refresh, we optimize, we change, we add new asset groups, we add new campaigns, all that stuff. So that is important to know. You have to keep your campaign uh, sort of in shape, but of course that should be obvious because I talk here about the most important points for setup and initial optimization, let's say. So with all of that stuff out of the way, finally, let's jump into the first topic that I mentioned here, and that is the PMAX setup and the perfect settings. Okay, so in this account right here, that is just a demo account, right? You, of course, go ahead, you create a campaign without a gold's guidance as always, and you select performance max. And then that is the first quick important thing. You want to have one primary goal only, in this case, purchases, right? So this is kind of a random account, not an actual e-com account. Make sure that you only select purchases. 
as your number one conversion goal or as your only conversion goal. One thing that is not important for the sake of this video is showing you products. So you would go ahead here and say advertise products from a Merchant Center account, but because I would have to blur things all over the place in this video when doing it with an account with Merchant Center products, I don't do it, but it's not important because asset groups, assets and everything is much more important than just clicking products, right? There is nothing fancy about that and I will talk about that in the end of this video. Then you have a final URL that is not the URL that you ultimately send people to. You know, that's not important yet. You will just get some ideas from Google if you select one. But now we give it a name and let's call it like Pmax video, right? Of course, you would give it a descriptive name in the end. And we just start with a new campaign. So the important part now is, of course, you want to select conversion value if you're an e-commerce brand. And you don't want to start with a target. That's the first important point, right? You don't want to start with a target because Google should spend your money for a little while at least trying to find out what a typical customer costs you to acquire. So if you start with, let's say, a 400% target, because let's say that's your break-even ROAS or your typical ROAS, whatever, right? You will have a fairly restricted campaign initially. It's not an absolute no-go to do that, but I recommend, especially if you don't have that much conversion data in the account, right? Like under 50 conversion conversions, under conversions a month, just start without a target. Google might overspend a little for a week or two, but that's just something you have to be sort of fine with. Don't, don't start Pmax campaigns if you are super, super tight on budget. In that case, rather use shopping, a little bit of search, etc. Pmax need sort of time and budget to flow a little bit. So you don't need to spend a thousand bucks a day, but still, that's important. I will talk about a little bit more about budgets in a second. Here, that's something that a lot of people ask me about as well. Do not optimize campaigns for acquiring new customers customers, at least for the most part. There are some cases where we do it, but even with our large clients, 90% of the time we don't do it. Um, and the reason is we have a lot of testing going on, right? We have tested all kinds of things and we have a bunch of clients that have Google as their absolute primary channel that allows us to very specifically determine what sort of impact certain actions have, right? Because the, the, the performance isn't diluted with like meta and organic and native ads and all that stuff. So we can test these very, very well. And we just noticed that it seems that overall performance is simply a little bit better when you don't do it, which of course makes sense, you might say, because you're now working with existing customers too. But we can see in the Shopify backend that we're not just, you know, um, selling to existing customers. We are in fact getting mostly new customers. And I simply recommend to leave this the way it is. It, it, it will just normally serve you better, okay? But um, in other settings, uh, other settings will be very, very important in a second. Of course, you choose your country of choice um, that you want to sell in. You know, the account here is in German, uh, in German and I live in Germany. So of course, that will be the default and you select the default language of that country, of course. Now, this is the first really important part, and that is allow Google to help you create assets. You don't want text assets and you don't want final URL exp expansion. Again, 90% plus of the time. We have some campaigns where we keep it for a whole bunch of reasons, right? But just simply for, for the sake of it and for easier understanding, make sure that those boxes are unchecked because you want to manually craft the text assets that are much better than Google wants most of the time at least. And you don't want final URL expansions because you want to define a final URL and you want to use products and those will then determine where people will land on. If you use expansion, Google can send you, you can send people to block pages and all that stuff. And even though you can exclude those URLs, as it says here, it's just easier to do positive targeting, so to speak, rather than doing it backwards and allowing everything and then, you know, uh, restricting pages and so on and so forth. So remove those two things. Then another thing that is very important, page feeds, you know, normally, as I said, you would have attached a merchant center. So that is all uh, fine. That one here is very important though. You want to remove or add a brand list, right? This is one of the most common mistakes. Most brands out there have completely messed up performance max results just because they are not using brand lists. So in other words, if you are a nomad, this brand right here, and you have a performance max campaign where you allow people to search for nomads specifically, you will have highly inflated ROAS numbers, of course. You might have a ROAS of five, but if you clean the performance by all the additional brand sales that you have gotten from people searching for nomad uh, to titanium bands, etc., it might just be two instead of five in reality or three or 1.6. I've seen it all. I've seen campaigns that were all 
brand. I've seen campaigns that were half brand, 10% brand and everything in between. So again, for simplicity reasons, make sure that you just attach your brand list. We have again, as always, you know, nothing's absolute. We have some cases where we don't do it for a bunch of reasons, but just for you to keep in mind, just add, you know, create a new brand list, which just essentially is just the URL of your site. And then you attach it here. And what this does is, it uh, stops Google from just showing your site to people that are already familiar, uh, that, that are already searching for it, right? You want cold traffic. You want to have a separate brand search campaign. That's not the top topic of today, but make sure that this campaign here is purely focused on new customers, cold traffic, because that's the only thing that's really scalable, right? So those were the key settings. You can add your site and then you get some, you know, inside. Google will create some assets for you. You can do it. You can get some, draw some inspirations that way. But for the sake of this video, again, not that important because I would rather show you, um, you know, what makes a good asset and so on and so forth. So with that being said, we are already, as you can see, in the third step right here. I talk about budgets a little bit later again. We talk about asset group structure for maximum performance. That is the first really important thing here in this video, I would say. Many people don't know how to structure asset groups. And in my opinion, um, there are generally sort of two ways to structure them by. The first is by category. And if we look into this brand right here, it could, for example, be, you know, leather bands for Apple Watches, right? Or metal bands for Apple Watches, or it could be MagSafe. Uh, chargers or something like that. It doesn't have to be the smallest subcategory. It can be the top level category, depending of course on how many you have. If you have just as this brand here, just a, a few categories with a few subcategories, um, it can make sense to just use the subcategories. Even though I would argue leather bands is fine as an asset group rather than, you know, modern bands, traditional bands, because you have to think about it that way. How much search volume and, and how clearly defined are the differences between those ultra specific subcategories. Is there really an entire market for slim bands versus modern bands versus active leather bands versus traditional bands? Not really, right? There is very, very clear overlap, but you could say that leather bands and metal bands are a totally different thing. There are totally different, you know, key audiences, let's say. Maybe there are different demographics as well. Maybe there are different, entirely different interests and, and so on and so forth. And same goes, of course, for things like for example, iPhone 15 or 14 cases. It's very obvious that, that those are different audiences with different people um, just owning like different phones, right? So this might also be um, a category that you, those might be individual categories to choose. You could technically make an iPhone 15 asset group, a 14, a 13, and completely fine tune your messaging. Um, of course, it also depends a little bit on your budget. If you have $50 a day to spend, you wanna keep things a little more generic. And if you have 2000 to spend, you would probably fine tune more because it's worth it. If you can only spend 50 bucks a day, there is no point in getting super granular in other words, if you have a $50 per day budget in that particular case, by the way, $50 in my opinion is the minimum Pmax budget, I would probably just go with leather bands and metal bands if those are your key products, right? If you say all of those are equally important, I would probably do one for cases, one for Apple Watch, one for charging if they were all three, let's say the, the, the three main categories, right? So cases, Apple Watch charging, um, if the budget increases a couple hundred dollars, you can subdivide a bit more, right? That is the important part here. Um, so you would, the number one way to separate asset groups is by product categories. Why? Because product categories typically share the same audience and very similar assets. And that's what you want. What you don't want in that particular case is you don't want to do it purely by audience. Um, it's something that you can, you know, it, it can sometimes be a little bit of a push when a, when an asset group like fell asleep and is not performing anymore, just adding like different as, uh, audiences or a new asset group with new audiences can give it a fresh push. Yes. And we do that. But on a fundamental level, when you're setting up the campaign, um, that is not an ideal structure, right? You can test it. You can play around with it a little bit. There is nothing inherently wrong with it. But if you want to have a clear setup, a clean setup and a scalable setup, it's typically best to do it based on category, based on having very similar assets, right? So you want to have asset groups within uh, with, with, with assets for a very similar range of products. So having an asset group for um, titanium metal bands and wireless charging uh, chargers, would be a little bit off and the assets just wouldn't make any sense, right? So that is a great first way to separate it. So let's, in this case here, call this, um, for example, leather 
band or let's actually use the titanium bands right or the metal bands so let's call it the metal bands asset group okay of course you would add the business name right what was it again nomad right <laughs> nomad goods or nomad whatever you would add of course a logo that is simple but now let's talk about the real stuff and those are headlines descriptions images etc etc the final URL, very straightforward. You want to advertise if this is a if this is a, um, a category for metal bands. What you would do is you would typically use the category page as your URL for this final final URL box, right? If you run an e-commerce brand, for the most part, you will send people to the direction or to the page of your product pages anyway. So don't think that if you add the URL of the category here, that all your people will go to the category, right? Because of course, most of them will click on an actual product page, uh, an actual product ad, and then they will land on the actual product page. So for example, on that steel band right here. But of course, if you target an entire asset, if you target an entire category in an asset group, then I normally just send people to the category page. Again, there is an exception though, if you have one absolutely clear bestseller, let's say, you know, they don't have that many products here. Let's say that they get 90% of their sales from the titanium, from, from the uh, titanium band, because those are from what I see, just different colors. And that's what makes the, you know, main difference of that product basically. And, and it's technically just one product with two variants. Um, then you can also just send them to this product page, because if you know that 80% of your sales in that category come from that one product anyway, then it's normally a better URL to choose because um, I found product pages to work generally a little bit better than category pages, just because you are one step further in the funnel now. Um, but of course, if it's very diverse, if you have many products within that category, then you would typically just use the category URL. When we talk about headlines and also descriptions and also assets, here is one important principle. And now we are technically, of course, in that asset that actually perform um, uh, step, right? And that is quality over quantity. What I see is that many people do, you know, they simply want to get as many headlines, as many descriptions, as many images as possible into their um, asset group. And that is not the right thing to do. You would rather have, let's say, 10 headlines that are very carefully crafted and you would rather have, you know, um, like eight images that are very, you know, that, that are gr greatly showing your product that are very diverse rather than having 20 images where you're just repeating the same image from five different angles, you know, all white background kind of boring shots. Performance Max assets are really about quality. So first things first, you want to make sure that with the headlines, um, you are in line with the goal of the campaign. For the most part, you want to have a direct, immediate performance performance max campaign, right? You want immediate performance. It is not really about top of funnel stuff yet. It's typically bottom of funnel, maybe middle of the funnel. And later on, you could technically launch dedicated PMAX campaigns specifically for top of funnel activities, right? So um, with our clients, for example, that sometimes spend tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars per month just on Google for their, for their brands, we really strategically think about, okay, what could be a good bottom of funnel PMAX campaign, middle and then top of funnel. With the top of funnel PMAX campaign, we have completely different target ROAS goals, right? We have lower goals, for example. Um, we just want to get people into the funnel. We want to do retargeting later on. We have different assets that are not as transactional, let's say. We're using more UGC stuff. We're doing more, you know, um, uh, awareness stuff. And with awareness, I don't mean just mindlessly blowing money, right? It's, they, these people have to convert later on and soon, like as soon as possible. But um, if you have sufficiently high budgets, then you can actually use multiple PMAX campaigns with multiple targeting settings. And that's how you unlock like much, much more scale, right? What I'm talking about here though is certainly fine for even, you know, you could use it for multiple tens of thousands of dollars per month just in this one PMAX campaign for sure. Um, that's, not the, that's not the important part. So let's use primarily um, transactional um, headlines, right? So Google will give you recommendations here based on your site. And those are actually pretty good already. Luxury accessories, right? Even though it's it's a little bit generic still, but you get the idea, they, they look generally quite well. So what you could type in here in the case of that one is, for example, luxury titanium bands, right? Or um, well, let's, let's see, um, you could say something like, uh, um, <clears throat> stylish Apple watch bands, or you could say something like buy uh, luxury titanium 
bands. I'm not a big fan of using like call to actions here that much in the headlines, right? And of course, th this is a bad example because you wouldn't uh, use two headlines that are so closely related, but you get the idea that you can go in here and you should in those headlines when you make an immediate sort of conversion driven transactional campaign, you want to make sure that um, basically all the headlines are somewhat transactionally focused, right? Um, at the same time, what you want to do is you want to also um, highlight some of your key features or benefits. So in this case, great to titanium. Maybe we can say watch bands, but no, actually that's not too long. Great to titanium watch bands, right? Or we can say, um, DLC scratch resistant uh, watch bands. You know, maybe that fits in as well. DLC scratch resistant, th th that's probably too long. Watch bands, yeah, that's too, too long. So we just remove that part, not that important. D scratch resistant watch bands. So you get the idea, you can repeat the word watch bands. That's generally okay, because of course that's your main keyword, your mo most important keyword along with titanium bands, right? But you want to combine it with, you know, features, with benefits. Here, you can mention Apple Watch Ultra and Ultra 2, for example. Here, you have to be a little bit careful. That's a, spe a special case because our client that is a competitor of that one um, is also selling like Apple Watch bands, etc. And we know that sometimes you have to be a little bit careful, of course, when you sell trademarked items. You can do it like we can actually do it. Um, but you have to just make sure and see whether you get warnings. And if so, you have to adjust them later on. You have to maybe remove them, maybe rework them. You get the idea. But uh, for the sake of this video, of course, and because most of you guys are probably not selling trademarked items, um, this will be much easier. And you can simply go through your entire site, you know, ultra optimized uh, 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 sort of band over here, wider frame. That's, an, that's a feature that I would probably highlight in one of those headlines. That one here, definitely, right? This is some, something that would be important. So with that particular product here, with that particular site, that is very well done, in my opinion, um, it would definitely be possible to craft 15 high quality headlines that are all somewhat transactional, highlighting the main features, the main benefits without being too repetitive and being like very, very powerful. Um, you can also generate some headlines for inspiration. I do that as well, but I can say that most of the time I end up using the ones that I manually or that we manually write and, and, and text, right? Um, just because of course I've probably written I don't know how many thousands of headlines over the years for Pmax, Search, Display, etc. And of course, you you very quickly understand, okay, what is the good way to write a short headline that will still have an impact on performance, that that mentions the most important things, that is not too long. And even though Google, you know, can generate some really good headlines here for sure, uh, I find myself just just getting like better headlines. And also when I ask the client whether it's in line with their brand voice, they often say that the ones that we write, you know, they sound much better, they're much more in line, etc. So use it for inspiration, keep some of them if you like, but in general, you know, make sure that you also um, have your own headlines that are very specifically made for it. With long headlines, it's the same thing. What I like to do here is I simply, um, for the most part at least, I tend to do something like I stuff a bunch of uh, key features, right? So it could be something like um, uh, sort of titanium Apple Watch bands with, um, now we could do this again here. Let's just uh, magnetic clasp. With magnetic clasp ultra optimized and scratch resistant. By the way, guys, um, this is all from the top of my head, right? I didn't prepare all the headlines and all the description for the sake of this video to make it a bit more natural and organic. So of course, if this was an actual campaign that I launched, I would probably spend, I don't know, at least an hour in this on the screen here with all the stuff that goes into it, right? But for the sake of this video, of course, I have to, you know, get write down some quick ideas and show you what it's actually about so that you can then apply it to your brand and your business. But this is an okay long headline, right? Nothing breathtaking, but you get the idea. Focus on some main product keywords and then talk about like some key features, some important stuff um, so that uh, you, you don't want to just say buy Apple Watch Bands, buy Apple Watch Bands and then repeat the same thing, you know, titanium Apple Watch Bands, Bands for Apple Watch, uh, buy now, uh, 10,000 reviews, right? You can, of course, sprinkle in things like reviews, social proof, etc. but don't make it like ultra at 
heavy, let's say, and ultra uh, transactional by just talking about buy, 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 call to action, etc. Then we have short description and long description. For the descriptions, um, uh, I like to write it uh, to not write it all in capital letters, right? So something like that. Shop Nomad for premium accessories for the modern lifestyle. That is a pretty decent description here. Google, in my opinion, did a pretty good job. The short description, of course, same format, but just with fewer characters. Also, when it comes to the description, what I like to do is I like to mix more of a like full sentence kind of thing where I'm talking, you know, about the brand, about like why people should choose us and what makes it special, along with just repeating and counting features, right? Scratch resistant technology, premium grade materials. Uh, let's say also something like uh, optimized, optimized for wider frame, optimized for wider frame by now. Perfect, 90 characters, there you go. So, scratch resistant technology, premium grade materials, optimized for wider frame, buy now. You see what I did there? I was basically um, using kind of a bullet point format where I talk about all kinds of features and benefits of that particular watch. And depending, of course, on how many features and benefits your product have and what they're, you know, if you sell a pair of socks, this won't be as sexy, right? You cannot, of course, talk about a pair of socks about, you know, the amazing features, or, even though you could argue there are some brands that probably do that. And if you have like the ultra next generation innovative sock, uh, where you spend $3,000 per day on a PMAX campaign in the end, then I will take it back. <clears throat> but for the most part, if you sell like very boring products, everyday products, you know, that don't have crazy features and benefits, and I understand that's probably quite a few brands that, that have this problem, then you have to get a bit more creative and you have to think about, okay, how do you mix these transactional things with, you know, actual... Um, with just pure facts about your product and how do you still evoke that sort of interest, right? Because that's the thing with ad copy, in my opinion. If you have an amazing product with crazy features, crazy benefits, like an insane value proposition, it's somewhat easy to write good ad copy. Not easy, but it's easier for sure. Whereas if you have a traditional everyday product, and again, many brands probably have that, it's a lot more difficult. And then you have to brainstorm a bit more. I then go ahead with our clients, for example, Whenever I advertise a product specifically, of course, I read the entire product page from start to finish. I read reviews, right? What are people to uh, talking about that? I literally uh, open this up and I go through at least 20, 30 of them to perfectly understand, okay, what's, what, what makes the product special? Why are people buying it? Why do they like it especially? Um, I sometimes research on other platforms as well. I've, you know, clients where I go to Reddit and I, I, I look up what, what people are writing about the particular product and so on and so forth. Of course, that's only doable if you have a somewhat larger brand. If you're just starting out, <laughs> there won't be many subreddits about your product and many threads about it. But you get the idea of really sort of thinking about everything that your product is about and then crafting some of these headlines for it. Now, Google will, of course, sc um, crawl your page and your socials. And this brand, in my opinion, has some pretty, pretty cool visuals already. So because we are in the part of like assets that actually perform, let me tell you a few things about assets. So one type of asset, and we start with images, one type of asset that, in my opinion, performs very well is stuff like that, right? Where you definitely highlight the product, but in an ambient environment. You have a person wearing the product, you know, cool shot, looks nice, neat, calm, Cool, cool things. Um, what also works well is something like that, where you show the product like in action, right? You show how people are opening it up or closing it, or you show um, how someone like pushes a button and turns it on, right? Or where someone, you know, has a finger, in this case of a smartwatch band, you know, you can show like the band and then um, someone push, uh, sort of touching the, the smartwatch. Of course, you don't want to make it about the smartwatch. That's the important part here. You want to make it about the band, but you want to make sure that um, in your asset you show your product in action okay so let's see this yeah this would also be okay as a video for example i was just about to say this is not showing the product in action enough but now that i see the full video definitely this is absolutely something that i would use as an asset um, as a video asset for performance max right because it definitely shows the product in action it, sh it highlights the product very very well yet it is not a pure you know slideshow of just showing your product from 20 different angles um, so that's very important. Then it is definitely okay to have like one or two nice, simple, clean white background or plain background images of your product as well, right? Because not everything has to be about just the fancy surroundings and, and, and ambient shots. 
remember that when you look into a Pmax campaign and you want to select your assets, right, you can uh, select 20 images. So what I can say here is you could do something like three to five images that are highly product focused, you know, literally the, pro the, the product with almost nothing else, white background, things like that. But the other 15 assets should be um, stuff that is not just the product. So this one here, right, you could do something like that. Let's uh, enlarge that a little bit. And then you could, for example, make sure that you are simply um, uh, making sure that the that the focus of that ad is actually on that particular um, on that particular product. So, for example, of course, you want to resize and make sure that uh, this is the case, right? In this case here, for example, I wouldn't use the uh, rectangle format or landscape format right here because that makes no sense. This is a perfect product for the one to one or four to five um, aspect ratio, right? And this is also important. Don't just go ahead and pick each and every image and just use all three um, aspect ratios. You should always pick the uh, aspect ratio that fits that particular image best. So here, for example, if we uh, look at that, that's of course uh, absolutely perfect for the landscape ratio instead of just cutting this out and making sure that you only look at the watch uh, band itself, okay? So what other assets are there that you could use? Well, um, I've showed you the lens, uh, I've showed you the you know product in action one, people using it, nice ambient shots. What you can definitely do as well is you can put little text overlays here, like for example, this one, right? Ultra optimized. If you use this, uh, this is probably a bit too much text and, and also too little, but you can say something like ultra optimized for wider frames. You know, nice text, uh, looks cool, very sleek, very modern, very elegant, along with that product image. So I could literally go ahead and make a, well, I, I would not make a screenshot of it if I want to use the final image really, but you could use that uh, sort of uh, um, image here, this part of the website. Of course, you have to rewrite this, as I said, it, it's best if you use like single headlines and taglines rather than like walls of text like here, but ultra optimized for wider frames use that image in that way. And this is literally like a feature driven image ad. Um, of course, you still have the uh, sort of headlines surrounding it, depending on the placement where Google places the final um, the final ad, but you can definitely include text in the images as well. People think that's a no-go, but that couldn't be further from the truth, right? You can use marketing language in your images as well. What we also, for example, sometimes do is we add a little mini testimonial in there, right? So you could remove that piece of text here and you could do something like, uh, you know, uh, most long lasting uh, Apple Watch band that I ever had. Or of course, that was a kind of stupid example, but looks phenomenal on your wrist or something like that, right? Super lightweight on your wrist. Something along those lines you could put on there, very quick and easy testimonial. Don't pick one that is like 20 sentences, of course. I wouldn't print that one here on an ad. Right, but something like, uh, you know, excellent, you know, that's probably also not that great of an idea, but the first part of that one, band feels good and looks amazing, even though this would be very plain. You wanna use a, a review that is a bit more, you know, um, unique, maybe in the wording. I'm sure that you will find one out there uh, on, on, your, on your product somewhere that someone has left. Um, but that should be very important as well. And that way you can really experiment with like the asset um, text, and so much more, okay? So it's not just about the pure image, you can definitely, definitely experiment with text on the images as well. So that's another type right there. What you can also do is you can make a comparison, right? If you have a product that you can easily compare to others, to competitors, you could, for example, have an image where you have where you show your product on one side and then the competitor product on the other side, you can then have like a, you know, for the competitor one, you gray it out a little bit or you have a little bit of blur or something like that. And you make very clear that this is the uh, sort of inferior option and yours is the better one. And then you highlight your, and then you highlight like the benefits of your own product, okay? So that is another great way to showcase your product and, and make it look like the much better option. Um, and so that people immediately see where the, where the differences are. For example, we have a bunch of clients selling like medical devices, um, things like supplements, etc. many of them, right? And especially in that space, there are numerous differences. Whether you buy one watch band or the other, sure, there are still quality differences, design, etc., etc. many of them. But especially with something like a, like a supplement or like a medical device with its own unique features and benefits, you know, that could be a completely different product. So using that sort of framework, and then sort of highlighting some of the key differences in like 
short bullet points on that image. Again, make it super easy to read, make it super short, combine this with some descriptions and headlines that go well with it, even though of course you cannot control it unless you make a dedicated asset group just for that, which by the way, we have tested and, and done as well, and it, it does work too. Um, but you get the idea of doing it in exactly that way because the more diverse your assets are, the more you will find out what really works and the better your performance will be, okay? Because Google shows you once the campaign is live and everything um, and it has gotten enough data, and I've mentioned that on other videos on this channel as well about asset optimization, etc. Google will show you how your assets perform. And the more diverse your set of assets is, the more likely you will have overperformers and underperformers. Um, you remove the underperformers and add new ones and you keep the overperformers. And that way, you always have the perfect flow of new, fresh, powerful assets. Videos, of course, is a bit more tough because I understand that, especially if you have like a small brand, you probably don't have the capacity to get like um, even just one very high quality video, let alone five. Again, principle is quality over quantity. If you have one amazing video, just give Google one instead of trying to squeeze some like, you know, um, as I said, uh, sort of uh, just slideshows of your products rotating or something like that. But the important part is add at least one because if you don't, Google will create a slideshow of your products by itself and this typically looks pretty terrible. So even if you can just get some fairly low quality video done, most of the time it's still better than Google's. So at that one. Um, if you have the choice, same principle applies. You can have two very short ones, you know, 20 seconds kind of things. You can have a long form video. Uh, people think that you have to use like shorts or ultra short reels or something like that. Um, but that's also not the case. You can definitely mix the two. Yes, I would probably not create a 20 minute video for a relatively simple product like that one. This, in my opinion, is an excellent video for um, Performance Max right there. Um, but you could have UGC, cont uh, UGC, right? You could have mixed testimonials in a video. You could show the product in action with some nice upbeat music. You could have another video um, that is talking a bit more about the product in a more like actual ad sort of format. You could have another one, again, where you compare it to a competitor and just do it that way. So many options there. And also what you should do is ideally you have videos in multiple aspect ratios, right? Make a vertical one, make a landscape one, a square one. The more diversity you can bring in there, um, the more likely you are to have some nice placements for all uh, of your potential customers. Now we talk about site links. What's important here is don't enforce it if it's not necessary. For example, if you sell just one product in your PMAX campaign, don't just come up with random site links. There is this idea of always use everything and I'm guilty of that as well to some degree. You know, in, in older videos I said use every extension, every site link, everything. Yes, use them if it makes sense. You know, if you sell a single product, don't come up with random site links that might actually distract the person. If you, you don't want to necessarily send them to your you know, sale page if you specifically specifically want them to buy that product because of the ads and everything. There is a very low chance of them like clicking randomly through the sale page and then, you know, buying like an, a discounted gear or an open box gear or whatever. Um, just send them to the key page. Of course, if you send them to a category page or if you want to sell iPhone cases, then you could have one cycling for 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. That would make sense. Same for the screen protectors. Or if you make it generally about, about uh, Apple Watch bands, you could use one for leather bands, for metal bands, you name it. So think about it strategically. Don't just apply site links for the sake of it, but rather think about whether it makes sense in the context or not. You know, don't overthink that. Don't want to spend too much time talking about it. It should be pretty clear. For the call to action, for the most part, you would simply go with shop now, okay? You can do automated, Google recommends it, but honestly, I don't see much of an advantage of letting Google test it. My philosophy is that you should not test everything. Uh, it's a very common thing out there, you know, test everything, test every little variable, but the point is if you don't have an infinite budget, you don't, and you don't have infinite time, of course, um, you shouldn't test everything, but rather you should make an hypothesis that you know has a very high chance of being successful and then just go with it. There is no point in testing every little nuance, so just go with shop now, there you go, done, cool. All right, search themes, better function, as you can see here, just, I wanna make this very uh, short, and that is now part of the audience's one-on-one, -on -one, so we are now in the next category. At your most 
high, at your highest performing search themes right here. Okay, just go ahead and throw some, you know, in, in that, that case, uh, it would probably be something like um, Apple Watch Ultra Band, Apple Watch, Apple Watch Bands, uh, Metal, Apple Watch Metal Bands, Titanium Bands, you name it, right? You put them in there. And here is an important thing about Pmax audiences that you definitely need to know and keep in mind. The audiences in Pmax, they are designed to put to basically steer Google and basically get it in the right direction. It's not to be confused with targeting, right? You're not targeting people. Um, you are just telling Google what sort of people to, to, to look at. And Google will then go above and beyond that. That's very, very important. You will not be able to just target. So what this means is you can add all these 25 searches and I recommend to do so. You can go into your search term report or if you're starting brand new, you can just basically just think about what are potential ways that people would search for your product. You can use the keyword planner as well. Many, many things that you can do there, right? But the important part is make them as closely related to your products in that particular asset group and to the main category that you're selling here, okay? And then we come to the actual audience signals. So the actual audience creation. And here, what is important is that there are that there is a hierarchy of, um, of audiences. And that hierarchy, basically means that um, there are multiple ways that you can target. So for example, here you have additional signals, right? Like interest, de uh, interest and detailed demographics. You have in-market segments, live events, you have um, affinity audiences. And how I go about it is uh, the highest priority should be your own traffic, right? So now my beautiful drawing skills will be used as well. Um, the, the first priority is your own traffic. So you would go here at your data and you say, for example, again, this is like a random account, doesn't make any sense, but you would come up, you would use an audience that is, for example, all your purchasers. When you go in here, I'm sure that you will see all converters Google Ads or all converters GA4, or maybe you have a customer list or something. And that is always your first good source of, of um, targeting, because again, remember, it's not about targeting, it's about steering Google in the right direction. And if you give them a list of 10,000 people that have converted in the past, that's a great source, almost like a lookalike audience. Well, actually, it's pretty much the same thing as a lookalike audience. And Google now knows which people to look for. The next good thing are um, uh, custom segments, okay? So here you will see based on all everything that we've showed to Google, it came up with watch accessories, watch bands, all of that makes sense already. But for now, you can run a new segment, uh, sorry, you can create a new segment right here. Whoops, uh, yeah, for some reason that doesn't work right here. I'm not sure what happens right now. Let's just try it again over here and cl click new segment. Um, okay, that's kind of weird. Normally, <laughs> normally you would be able to go ahead and create a new segment. And with that new segment, let's just try something here. Try, probably not much should come up. Um, okay, that's a little bit weird. Let's add a new segment over there. Uh, okay, so th th this sort of thing should normally come up, right? You see YouTube users and GA4 uh, segments and the same should normally come up when you go here and click on new segments and then you can define the segment yourself. Um, what that will do is you can do something like people that have searched for things like XYZ or you can define a custom segment of people that have used sites like yours and 10 of your biggest competitors. It's not that super important. So um, since I cannot create a new segment now for some reason, um, I will just leave it at that. But that is literally a super easy thing. You just click there and it's all self-explanatory, right? What's more important is that you keep in mind that the first priority is your own data. The second priority, whoops, the second priority is those custom segments in my opinion, because you can fine tune them to your liking a bit more, right? The third priority then, are so-called in-market audiences. So as you can see here, um, additional signals and here at the top, right, uh, you can go ahead and let me just remove that real quick. You can go ahead and browse audiences and at the top here, you will see in-market. Now in-market audiences are audiences that are, <laughs> as the name probably suggested, in the market for, in this case, phone uh, uh, Apple Watch bands, right? Those are not always like hyper specific. So if you have a very specific product, probably there won't be an in-market audience for it, right? But what you can do, for example, is you can search for Apple Watch Band. And I just want to show real quick instead of just browsing through it, 
Um, and you will see, for example, watches, you know, Android phones, and so on and so forth. So it's not like ultra specific, uh, but if you remove that, you will get uh, some uh, uh, recommendations already. So there is something for watch bands at least, not in this case, Apple watch bands or, or smart watch bands, but something like iPhone accessories might be relevant, watch bands might be relevant, right? So it's not as good as your own data and custom segments where you can define everything, but it's still fairly transactional. And then your last priority should be something like this uh, infamous um, sort of affinity audiences, right? So affinity audiences are pretty broad and they are normally in the billions and billions of impressions. So for the absolute vast majority of e-commerce brands, unless you're absolutely gigantic, but even then it's not the best way to start, um, they are not re relevant. So they would be probably number four. So that brings me to that hierarchy that I mentioned, own data, custom segments in market, and then you have those other things. Demographics, only if you truly know that your audience is, for example, female, right? Or if you truly, truly know that your age range is within 18 to 34 or something, because guess what? You are limiting yourself quite a bit. And especially because the unknown variables here are always very, very strong with Google Ads. So I recommend to almost always leave the unknown box ticked. Even if you know, for example, that you only want to sell to females, you can remove the mailbox, but you shouldn't uh, untick the unknown box because normally that is by far the biggest. Like let's say 10%, 10%, 80%, 15, 15, six, uh, <laughs> no, 15, 15, 70. My math skills right there. So that's the, that's the big thing. Unknown will have a large group of people in there. And the only time I don't use unknown is when I have a gigantic space. So one of our clients, for example, sells cosmetics to women, specifically hair care products, and they are doing pretty large numbers, right? I'm talking like good seven figures per month and very good six figures per month on Google with us. And in, in the, that case, I know that for a fact, all of their customers are female. So because it's a large market and it's a good, you know, a large brand, I untick the unknown box and make it literally only about uh, people where Google knows they're female. And if we at some point run out of traffic and we cannot scale anymore, right, then I can tick the unknown box, but I will never tick the mailbox because I just know that we will waste the tremendous amount of money there. And same goes for age, same goes for additional uh, demographics, even though with the additional ones, typically it tends to be even more extreme. Household income is only available in select countries anyway. So that is a bit more um, tough. Okay, so that's, those are the most important. Oh, now after five minutes, I could actually open up the tab. Yeah, Google sometimes still astonishes me. Um, that's amazing. So, you know, custom segments, pretty straightforward. You can uh, just uh, create them right there. So those are the key points about the assets, about the audiences, the order of lowest hanging fruits, which is very important, right? To make sure that you are not starting on the wrong end. You should start on the right end and make sure that it's easiest to make money and sales and then work your way up from there. And then when we have the budget, which I probably, yo, yeah, okay, I can actually click through it now. Um, here is another somewhat important part. There is no complete right or wrong when it comes to the budget, because of course it all depends on your case and um, you can always intervene. But I personally think that the minimum should be 50. Um, I would already consider 50 euros or $50 a pretty low amount for Performance Max. But if you go even lower than that, um, there are so many variables, assets, products, placements, audiences, you name it, that there is a pretty low chance you will have a very well optimized Performance Max campaign that way. So start with 50 or better yet, 100 euros or $100 per day minimum. And of course, if you have a larger brand, right? If you spend 50,000 a month right now, then I mean, it will simply take you more time if you run with a low budget. So if you say, you know, I can spend two, 3,000 on a, on a PMAX test, then just say 300, say 500, say 200, and just get some data more quickly, because then of course you can also optimize more quickly. As I said, this is about the PMAX setup. And when we work with clients, especially larger ones, we really go in depth into, you know, regular refinement, adding new asset groups, coming up with new ideas for creatives. When it's a really large client, we also work very closely closely with their um, creative teams and we tell them which assets to produce. So we tell them, hey, we would need 20 assets like that um, for a PMAX campaign. And then we research some competitor assets and we say, hey, can you make something like somewhat close to that, but of course targeted and tailored towards our brand. And then we strategically place them in different asset groups and PMAX campaigns. So we work very closely with our clients when they are a little bit bigger to justify um, 
getting like fully dedicated assets made. But that is a very important part that you shouldn't neglect, especially if you have higher budgets. Make sure that you assign some capacity towards getting PMAX specific assets done. First, you can definitely start with like your meta ads, you know, Facebook, Instagram ads. Um, you can definitely repurpose them. You can use images from your store. You can use images from your organic uh, social media uh, uh, profiles, etc. But at some point, um, you want to make sure that those are tailored because that way you can get, of course, super creative and target and tailor everything towards the performance max placement. There isn't really a maximum budget here, to be honest, but of course, you wouldn't normally start with something like a thousand bucks a day for no reason, unless you say, okay, uh, it's like, I don't know, Black Friday or a hot promotion, or you have a really, really large account, or you have a absolute winning product that you know will work and you want to scale it as quickly as possible. Um, then you can, of course, do that as well. So those were some of the most important points when it comes to those key aspects that I mentioned here, right? The setup, the budgets, the asset group structure, assets, audiences, and also now with the product, as I said, I've kind of answered the question or the, the point about products already during the video when I mentioned how to choose categories versus subcategories, etc. Because of course, you would only include the shopping products of that particular category or subcategory. Okay, now, if after all that input, after those yeah, 50 minutes now of showing you how to run a PMAX campaign, you still have some question marks above your head, you still don't know how to scale a PMAX campaign to one, two, three thousand a day net budget, or you just don't have the time to run your Google Ads and take it to the next level, or you don't want to do it and you rather spend your time in Meta or in your store or whatever, um, we work with international e-commerce brands, ideally making more than a million dollars a year across all channels, and we run their Google Ads and a little bit of Bing um, to really scale them to 200,000, 500,000, our biggest client, well over $2 million a year just from Google. And if that sounds interesting to you, if you could really need a helping hand in pushing your revenue to the next level and especially the cold traffic revenue, right? Nobody cares about how many people you can convert that are searching for your brand, but cold traffic, searching for, you know, uh, uh, broad keywords, that is our specialty. We only work with e-commerce 95% at least, uh, only work with e-commerce. We make sure that your merchant center is fully optimized, your feed is fully optimized. We give inputs on how to get the best performance out of your product pages. So we make sure that we get the most out of your Google Ads, no matter where you are right now, whether you spend 3,000 a month or 300,000 a month. If that sounds interesting, um, click the link below and watch the video about our Ignite framework that we use to do everything that I just mentioned and get in touch with us. I will give you a detailed roadmap. I will let you know specifically what's in it for you and for your brand. Be super honest and transparent about it and then you can decide whether you want to work with us or not or you simply continue watching videos like that, which is also perfectly fine. So if you enjoyed this video, then make sure that you leave a like, comment below uh, where you are with your PMAX campaigns. What is the biggest uh, sort of, what, what's the largest number that you ever scaled a PMAX campaign for? What is your biggest roadblock with PMAX right now? Let me know in the comments and if you want to see more Google Ads and performance marketing content for e-commerce, then make sure to subscribe and ring the bell uh, to not miss on any future videos like that because chances are there will be another long format video like that on either shopping or another one on PMAX or something else. Anyway, that's enough 53 minutes. I think that uh, you want to do something else now. So I wish you a great day. Please subscribe if you want to learn more. And I absolutely look forward to see you in the next video again. Thank you very much and bye-bye.